distinguished teaching professor of the social sciences and professor of economics at Carleton College. He's a labor economist whose work examines intergenerational connections in education and labor market outcomes. Um, Dr. Graw's book, Demographics and the Demand for Higher Education, examines how recent demographic shift are likely to affect demand for higher education. In a follow-up project that Agile College, which you all received yesterday, um, Dr. Graw draws on interviews with higher education leaders to provide examples of how proactive institutions are grappling with demographic change. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Graw. Thank you so much. It's a real exciting privilege to be with you all. Um, if you've read the book, you know that a lot of you are in it. So um, <laughs> maybe we can <laughs> move through quickly. As I come to the Northeast, you know, I'm aware when we talk about demographic change, you, know, you are the home to demographic change. So you've been doing it longer and better than the rest of us, to be sure. In some sense, demographic change has always been with us. Um, and is always with us. So if we look, for instance, at the changing composition of the country, this is several decades in the making. This graphic comes from William Frey at the Brookings Institution, and he's estimating when we reach a tipping point year in the country when we cease to be majority non-Hispanic white. For the country as a whole, it's mid-century, so we still have a ways to go. But of course, our industry is inherently future-looking. We serve a younger population, and younger populations are more diverse. If you look at those who are under age 18, we have already passed that tipping point. And so we are a diversifying country, and, and we are diversifying institutions. We see it in our own data. If you look at department ed education data on first-time college uh, enrollees, in 2000, over 70% of those students were non-Hispanic white. In 2018, it was only 54%. So we've seen a massive change, and we will continue to see a uh, massive change as we go through this. More recently, though, we've been struck by a different demographic change that's maybe a little bit more abrupt. Uh, now, in New England, you all have led the way. This is looking at total fertility rates by state. All those states in orange had fertility rates in 2007, right on the precipice of the Great Recession, below what demographers refer to as the replacement rate, the rate of fertility necessary to replace the population with fecundity alone. So that will be important as we go forward and see some regional differences that New England has had low fertility. But in 2007, all of those blue states were above the replacement rate, and the country as a whole was above the replacement rate. And then we saw the financial crisis, and I see most of you are old enough like me to remember that experience. It was a time of incredible uncertainty on our campuses, a lot of change and, and anxiety. Well, young families were having a lot of uncertainty and anxiety too. And they seem to have responded in part by decreasing the number of kids they're having. And while the economy recovered, the fertility rate has not. So this is CDC data on the number of births by year. Uh, we see that there, were, there was a decades-long sort of upward trend. And, and now we're on now more than a decade-long trend in the opposite direction. Uh, the final year here, 2020, we see that we continue to go downward. Uh, there was a 4% decline in number of births from 2019 to 2020. And if you're like me, you're thinking, ah, 2020, that awful COVID year. Um, I'm not a biologist, though my wife is, and she tells me that babies aren't born that way. Uh, it takes a little time. The 2020 births, I think it's nine months. The 2020 births were conceived typically previous to COVID. December 2020, we start to see the COVID baby. So we actually have reason to believe that 2021 is the year where we're going to see a decline in fertility caused by COVID. The 4% decline in 2020 was, was almost entirely driven by things that happened uh, through November. Uh, December was a bad month, to be sure, but 3% of the 4% decline happened prior. So most of us who serve traditional age students can anticipate that in an 18-year lag that, let's see, 2007 plus about... 18 years, in the mid-2020s, we'll see the front end of this. Uh, if we look at where the fertility declines took place, well, it happened everywhere. Um, so the, the New England area in particular, the Northeast in general, continues to lead the way. Uh, this is the same color scheme. So where before, the darkest orange was 15% or more below the replacement rate. The dark red now is 20% or more below the replacement rate. And you can see the entire uh, New England area is in that very, very low fertility state. Uh, so there's still a geographic component, and yet low fertility has spread throughout the country. 
So as I said, we can sort of look forward if we're thinking about the traditional age college, the, sorry, the traditional age college student. We can look forward about 18 years and looking at census data about who is here and some additional data on who's entering the country. We can ask what's likely to happen to, say, the number of high school graduates. That's work that the Western Interstate Commission does. Uh, really, really helpful work. But when we just look at high school graduates, that data then is equally relevant for all of us in the room, even though all of us serve very, very different student types. And so what I tried to do, and you can read about how in the book, was to disaggregate this a little bit and to create projections for uh, four-year and two-year institutions of different types. So in the upper left, we have the two-year institution market. Regional four-year institutions are those that are not ranked among the top 100 colleges or universities on the U.S. news lists. National four-year institutions in the bottom left are those ranked 51 to 100, and then finally the top 50 colleges and universities in the bottom right. And you see here a disaggregation also by uh, census region. Uh, so as I look across these four panels, what we're projecting here are the number of young people with demographic markers that in the past have been associated with attending institutions of these different types. So this is not a prediction of what's going to happen, but rather you might think about it as the size of the pool. I expect that we will respond. You all are already responding. And so what happened in the past won't necessarily just continue to play out. But it gives us a sense of what if we were on autopilot? And the college-going behaviors that took place in the recent past, in particular the year 2013, just continued to persist into the future, what would occur? As I look across those four panels, we do see that in the mid-2020s, in all of the regions and in all of the submarkets, there's a contraction. It's the echo of that decline in the number of people being born. Um, we also see some commonalities across the four markets by region. Because fertility was low in the Northeast, we see in the Northeast and in the Midwest, we're already on a downward slide, and then that just becomes more pronounced. Whereas in the West, they're on an upward slide, and then there's a contraction uh, that in some submarkets they will actually reverse. Um, now, my projections are looking at data that doesn't have all the births. So I was looking at 2017 was the last uh, year of data I had. Now we have a few more years. So we know that there are a few more, unfortunately, down years after these projections. As I look across the panels, I do see some differences in the submarkets. Why is it that as we move toward more selective institutions, the slope becomes more positive and we have this demographic contraction laid on top? That has to do with the changing composition of parents in our population. As the access agenda that Complete College America has been pushing has actually succeeded, we have more and more parents who have college degrees. And that's a great predictor of sending your students to college, for your college more specifically, and even more particularly to more selective forms. And so we have this changing composition that leads to the, the different submarket trends. We can also ask what happens to each of these submarkets to the race ethnicity makeup. Um, so in the left two most bars, you have the projections for what happens to the 18-year-old population. This is the story you all have seen in the news. We have the diversification that William Frey's work was pointing to. Um, in this time period, we will expect in the next 15 or so years to pass that tipping point in the college age population. We see the, the black portion go below 50%. That's non-Hispanic whites. This is driven by an increasing share uh, primarily of the Hispanic uh, students. That's the, the yellow bar getting bigger. As we move to the right, we see projections for the subset of young people with demographic markers of attending these different institution types. And as you look at the two-year institutions in particular, notice how much it maps onto what's going on in the population as a whole. Just a reminder that uh, the two-year sector is serving a really representative cut of the American population. As you move toward more selective forms of higher ed, you see that the, the match isn't quite the same. Though I would note that the share of the pools in each instance that is non-Hispanic white is shrinking. We have a diversification across higher education. It doesn't matter what part of higher education you're in, you're going to look at more diversification. Um, I looked at the model and I asked, well, what if we were to cut immigration by half? A lot of people say, well, you know, a lot of this is driven by immigration. Well, some of it is driven by immigration. It is true. The rate of diversification would slow, particularly among Asian American and Hispanic Americans, if we saw a contraction in immigration. But even if you cut immigration by half, each and every one of these sectors would be more diverse in the 2033 and 34 entry classes than it is today, which is to say that the diversification of America is built in, it's baked into who we are at this point. And while immigration does contribute, it doesn't define our country as a diversifying space. That's defined by just who we are. As you look toward the more selective uh, forms, we see that the pool is diversifying also because of an increasing share of uh, Asian American students. So I think it's interesting to note that while all subsectors are diversifying, the way that plays out might be a little different in some subsectors than others. But we will all have to continue to grapple with this change in composition. Let's skip that slide. <coughs> 
So how does higher ed respond? Um, I think it's interesting, in addition to these demographic forces, Yolanda mentioned some of the competitive forces that we face. Uh, we have uh, industry seeking to provide credentials that are substitutes for what higher education provides. You know, as she was speaking, I thought, boy, that's, that's threatening. And here you have somebody in the higher ed space, or is she, I'm not sure, saying she's you know, welcoming this, this competition. And I think ultimately we have to welcome that. Um, if I'm doing my job, I should be more than happy to hear that somebody else is trying and that should spur me on to do better what I do so that it's not a, a threat to my existence. But I think we have to recognize there's some pressures coming from competition. As we face major changes, um, I was struck as Donnell was speaking about a, uh, a quote I heard from uh, Randy Deakey, where he was talking about leadership and, and the need to move forward despite the fact that you don't necessarily get everyone on board. And he said, leadership is really about momentum, not consensus. And I think that has to be part of what we do on our campuses. We can't wait for everybody to say, yes, we're all on board. If we do, that's followership, not leadership. On the other hand, we really do have to find those key members of our communities that have to be brought on board. Uh, so I think Deakey has a point. So as we think about how institutions might change, one thing we might do is to look for a diversification of our pool. If traditional age college students are getting smaller in the domestic market, we might look for more international students, or we might turn to the adult learner. But as we think about serving new student groups, um, yes, we have, we have one of the celebrities in the room here, Pam Edinger. You said you stole his speech for later. <laughs> okay, so I'll keep it brief. Uh, Pam has led an institution that is doing exactly this, but she was wise to point out that you can't simply say, well, we'll welcome, our, we'll welcome a different student group. You have to think about what that student group needs at every part of the institution. And that, in turn, requires that you bring people along with professional development. I was talking um, at my breakfast table this morning about that important role of professional development that faculty and staff have uh, a, a good form, in many cases, of change resistance. We don't want higher ed to just blow in the wind with fads. And so when we see new ideas, there should be a healthy skepticism. But when our immune systems get um, overly sensitive, we can have things like allergies that, that are unproductive. The way that we can help people along is, as Pam suggests, to remember that we have to have robust professional development around our intentions to change which students we serve. In part, this is about recognizing new student groups bring new student needs. That's true. But we also have to recognize new student gr groups bring new student assets. And when I'm teaching, if I don't change the way I teach, I don't capitalize on those new assets that are in the room. I expect we'll see a renewed urgency to the access agenda. And that's appropriate. It's certainly right to do. And in the context of declining student numbers, it might be a financial necessity as well. Um, this is just looking at the opportunity that is embedded in the fact that we have not achieved parity across this, in this case, uh, the dimension of race and ethnicity. Um, I would point out, if you look at the red line, uh, the, the share of high school graduates that are non-Hispanic black attending college, there's an, a, a particularly worrisome story for the moment we're in right now. If you look at what's going on with that line, we see this convergence on the national average, and then in 2010, a reversal that's now turned into a long reversal. What happened in 2010? I think initially we thought that the, the setback was driven by the Great Recession. It hit the African American community more than it hit other communities. So it seemed natural that, okay, there might be a blip here in matriculation rates. But notice that while the Great Recession itself was perhaps a transitory event, the consequences have turned into a new trend. And when I think about COVID and we see the data that are coming out about enrollments, my big worry is that we make what have been transitory blips. We've seen first-generation, low-income students not attending college at the same rate. That cannot turn into a new trend. Um, not when we see the need for an educated workforce that we have and a declining pool. We have to make sure that those are indeed blips that we get sorted out pretty quickly. And I think there is an urgency to sorting them out pretty quickly because we now have two falls worth of data. And it, it, you, know, you start to worry that, okay, if it turns into three years, is that just a blip anymore? Or have we started a trend that might become more persistent? As much as I would love to think that the access agenda could overcome the decline in births, we've already seen a 17% decline in the number of young people being born, 17%. Is it really plausible that we are going to overcome that decline in population by expanding matriculation rates? I don't think so. I think we're gonna have to do more of what Complete College America is inviting us to talk about, which is making better use of the students who already arrive on our campuses. We have to do better with student success and retention. This can take a lot of different forms. Uh, for instance, in the upper left, St. Cloud State in uh, Minnesota has been surveying students in the third week there on campus to identify those students with low sense of social belonging, who despite having a 3.0 or better, have a high attrition rate, a 20% attrition rate into spring semester. 
They're trying to find those students who are on the precipice of walking away and then get that information in the hands of faculty and staff so that they can reach out to those students. Now, I think it's important to note, as Ben noted, that the people who are involved in whether or not a student stays on campus is everybody. It's the janitor in the dorm. It is the professor in the office hour or the classroom. And yes, sometimes it's the enrollment management office. But of course, on our campuses, usually the work of, en of enrollment management is where we see this taking place and it, it has to be changed. At Wheaton, the way they're trying to make sure that this belongs to everybody is just building it into the compensation package. Until they reach, or when they reach, a first year retention goal, the entire campus gets a raise. It's a way of, s of reminding people both of the importance of what this means to the financial bottom line of the institution, but also, in my, in my roommate's case, it, it absolutely was. The, the dorm custodian was his primary contact point. Um, at reunions, he seeks her out um, in the basement of, of the dorm that we, that we uh, lived in. Um, every one of us on campus has to be aware that we're re-enrolling students. At Rutgers, they're working with the, the student work program. We know that most students on campus will have student work assignments. Can we make student work supervisors trained in mentorship so that they're doing weekly pulse checks with their, their student workers to try to figure out, you know, where are you at and what kind of support do you need? Um, I think it's a, a nice case example. Rutgers has a great retention rate, but they're not satisfied. Um, I think about uh, what Donofi was talking about in terms of retention and how it's not enough to simply look at the aggregate. You have to break it down. Uh, you might be doing very well and pat yourself on the back in the aggregate and be failing to see that there are subgroups of students, whether by income or by geographic location or by race, ethnicity, that aren't doing as well. And we need to strive for all students having the same successful experience. So despite having a high retention rate, Rutgers is, is looking for how can we work on those, those corners of our campus where we don't have that same success and might student work be an, an overlooked opportunity for that. I don't think we're going to recruit different students and retain them better without altering what we do as our primary product. We have to be willing to talk about the academic program. Just a few examples. Um, in the upper left, we have, again, some of that work from Strata pointing out of the, the incredible importance of seeing relevance of coursework. In this case, they're talking about associate degree program recipients who either do or don't also carry a credential. And we see a, a fairly stark difference in those students who said their education made them attractive job candidates. 70% of those with a non-degree credential versus 43% of those without. Uh, at Dunwoody, it means changing the schedule. Uh, they find that adult learners in particular would rather take one course for eight weeks and one course for eight weeks rather than two courses for 16. Um, we were talking at breakfast again how this, this is disruptive. If, if you ask me to change my course and teach it in half the time at twice the intensity, I would have to rewrite the course. So we have to, again, plan for actually providing the opportunity to do that work. But it, it's disruptive for us because it can be really potent for the students. It really is a fundamentally different experience. Uh, the New Hampshire Community College system, you know, the, the example I wanted to pull there was much like the main system, where there were things that they wanted to get done with pathways that they didn't have the professional expertise on one campus to accomplish. But wouldn't you know, if you brought the campuses together, you did have enough expertise to fundamentally revise the curriculum. It wasn't about, as in the case of Maine, it wasn't about getting rid of the institutional identities. It was rather about leveraging the resources that already existed in the system but weren't necessarily coming into contact with one another. The Transformational Partnerships Fund is a relatively new intervention. Um, it's funded by Sea Change, ECMC, Kresge, and Ascendium. Um, they are looking to give grants to those institutions that recognize it might be a merger or it might be a really fundamental partnership. So if you're looking to do work that's going to fundamentally transform how you work with other institutions, they're willing to help solve the problem of we can see a different future that's sustainable, but we, can't, we don't have the resources to get there from here. Um, I think that's a really great innovation within the higher ed philanthropic space that recognizes that we might have to fundamentally rethink some of our institutions and that might involve creative partnerships and that that takes money. Uh, COVID connections. <coughs> COVID in general is not our friend in the demographic space either. Um, economists estimate we might see a decline of something like five to seven percent and then a reverse in 2021. So the low birth rates continue. Early data from December of 2020 through March of 2021 confirms that we did see much lower births. But I think there are some real opportunities with COVID as well. So first, we were all re-reminded about the importance of student-centered teaching and learning. Um, at Carleton, we were really, really be, uh, lucky. We only had a six and a half percent decline in uh, enrollment last year. So I know some of you have seen worse. 
But 6.5% in conversations about how you're not getting a raise and we're going to dramatically reduce how much we're putting toward your, your retirement really grabs the attention. And a lot of us as faculty were, okay, let's, you know, my advisee's saying they might not come back. Let's talk. What do you need? What do you need specifically, very specifically, you need to come back? And I think we were reminded about the importance of that very student-centered approach. Um, retention is a holistic problem with holistic solutions. The fact that I was doing office hours by my, you know, my Zoom, and I had a digital window into their home, I could recognize that what I perceived as an algebra problem, also, it, there was an algebra problem, also had social capital components, and it had financial capital components, and I could see the siblings running around in the background, and it, it helped me as a faculty member be reminded that retention initiatives are going to have to talk more about, their, yes, there's going to be a student support component, an academic support component, but there are other aspects of this problem that I as a faculty member need to think about. And we just had a great experience to launch those conversations on our campuses. Remember those office hours experiences you had. What did you see and how can we help as faculty members to lean into those other parts of the problem, not just the, the academic part, which is also important. We learned about ourselves that we can be agile. I don't know how many times I hear us joke about ourselves, that we are really sclerotic, nothing can get done in two years' time. Um, that, is, that is just such garbage. <laughs> uh, my institution is a residential campus. We will always be a residential college. If you told me in December of 2019 that we would do significant online course offerings in the next decade, I would have said, no, you're wrong. And in March, we did the entire campus went online and non-residential in two weeks' time. Apparently, we are capable of more change than we gave ourselves credit for. And as we look forward to the changes that need to still come, I think it's great for us to remember we actually accomplished a lot together. We can do more than we think. Now, there's also change fatigue. So some people say you're being a Pollyanna here. This is, this is not helpful. And, and I acknowledge that we have a challenge of getting over the change fatigue. But I think if we can pause for a moment and recognize what we accomplished in the last two years, there's a powerful moment there. And then finally, we're seeing, and this is the change fatigue, a reminder of the importance of investing into shared governance, and particularly that you have to do it when you don't need it. Because last year, we really needed it. And so I'll just speak for my campus. We saw some cracks between the faculty and administration because the administration had to make decisions on a very, very tight timeline with less input than they normally would, would want. And, and that caused some real tensions. But I think it really wasn't the COVID decision-making that, that, that we were seeing. It was there were some other things in our go shared governance process that hadn't been invested in enough pre-COVID, and then COVID just made those come to the surface. And so it was a reminder that if we're going to have to be agile and if we're going to make all this change, we need to be looking for how can we lean into the shared governance model, how can we invest in that, so that when we do have to call on some chips, we have them available. So finally, I would note, I, I saw a Washington Post article. I don't think it was anyone in this room, but somebody in the Northeast referred to the coming demographic decline as the apocalypse. Mid-2020s, we look at that as the apocalypse. And I thought, wow, that, that's got to be a uniquely unhelpful analogy. <laughs> because if it's the apocalypse, I should just go home, right? There's nothing to do in the apocalypse. But what we see in the conversations that I witnessed here this morning is a reminder that, no, we actually have a lot of agency. And so this comes from uh, Ed Bennett over at EAB. He did a blog post where he pointed to Tlaib's book on anti-fragility, where Tlaib writes that, look, there are three responses to stress. We often think of the first one as fragility. We break. We know that's bad. So then we might aspire to robustness or resiliency. Like a turtle, I'm just going to hunker down. The stress hopefully will wash over me and leave me unchanged. But there's a third, actually more optimistic response to stress, and that's anti-fragility. And Bennett was asking, can higher ed become, or is it already an anti-fragile system? So that as we go through these stresses of demographic change, while it might not be pleasant exactly, maybe in 2045 we look back and we say, we've expanded access. We have better... Uh, served all of our students, we have more equitable student success outcomes. We have improved retention. And we have revised our academic programs so that they're better aligned to student goals and where they want to get. And so while I wouldn't say that the past 20 years was fun, I would say that it was rewarding because we were better fulfilling our missions. And so that's what I hope for higher education in the next 15 or 20 years, that we experience this as a moment of anti-fragility, that yes, it's painful, and there are going to be some hard choices to be made. We're going to have to lead with, with momentum, not wait for consensus, and that will be challenging at times. But if we can come out the other end, better fulfilling our missions and better serving our students, which we've been reminded multiple times this morning, is ultimately what we really are all about. We might yet look back and say it was worth it. So I'll stop there and, and leave the floor to questions. <laughs>
I was just wondering if you have disaggregated data on the African American and Latinx um, decline in enrollment, particularly the African American by gender, so that we understand um, in the past African American women have been leading in enrollment and completions um, within that demographic, but do you have more data on that? And then also, do you have any data around parent learners or working adults? Great question. So on the first one, any, any difference by sex, the answer is no, I didn't break the projections down. And that's because the exercise was to look back at 2013 behaviors and just project it out. So what do we know? Well, we know that women did attend college more, and my model just builds that in. And so you, you just continue to have the same disparities that you see today go out in the future in the projections. Um, we know that in the United States, at least uh, in our births, uh, we have more or less sex parity. So it's not like we get massive shifts because all of a sudden, you know, in the cohort born in 2010, there are just way more girls or something like that. Um, now, this isn't to say we should be satisfied with that. It's a great reminder that this, this male-female disparity is something at this point that we really need to think about as one of the levers that we might pull. It was a lever we pulled in the 1980s in the opposite direction to overcome a demographic decline then. Um, so the projections just kind of build in an unfortunate tendency we've seen. As far as the adult learners, um, that's, that's a much trickier problem because they come back at different times. So my work definitely focuses on what happens at the, at the traditional age attenders. Um, the Department of Education data I was using doesn't even track students beyond their roughly mid-20s, 26, which is really unfortunate because I think when we think about students who are non-traditional students, you're just getting kind of interesting when we get to age 26. That's when the, the fun begins. And so I, I think we're the, the way to attack that problem would just be fundamentally different than the way I did it, given the data sources that I had. Pe people tend to think that the sort of elite, wealthy, residential liberal arts colleges are relatively Im immune from you know, going out of business or being disrupted. W what's your sense about, like, what's Carlton going to look like in no. 10 years? So I would say there's, there's something right, but more fundamentally something wrong. Um, so the fundamentally, the, the something right is we saw that this change in composition sort of favors the more selective institutions. And let's acknowledge, to begin with, that they are more selective, which means they already have more applicants than they need by a long shot. And so, yes, it is true that they are in a somewhat privileged position. They're insulated more from this than the regional institution that, that is more or less open access. That said, when my colleagues go there immediately, I think, oh, that's worrisome. Um, the reason why I'm optimistic for my future at Carleton is predicated on us actually fulfilling our mission and doing so more effectively every year. If we do our job, I'm confident that we can sell it, but I think we have to recognize that while we might look at those projections and say, that looks pretty good, there are other parts there that don't look so good. And we have overlap, either directly or we overlap with someone who overlaps with some of those institutions that are gonna be in a much more competitive environment. So right now, our financial aid office and student um, admission services folks are pretty good at explaining why should you consider Carleton with a comprehensive fee of about 75,000 when you might be getting a merit aid offer that you know, brings your price down to say 50,000. But what if that competition turns that 50,000 into 40,000? Does our story still sell? I don't know. I think it could sell, but I think we're actually gonna have to work it in order to sell that. So I think we have a lot of work cut out for us because I think the, the more fundamental truth is we are all in a competitive market together. Yes, some parts have a little bit more slack than others, but at the end of the day, competition, um, you know, it, it doesn't let anybody off the hook. And so my hope for Carleton is that we keep having professional development conversations about how do I need to adapt so that we really speak to, you know, for instance, we, we do not recruit um, very well. When, when we look at, we're doing better with Hispanics, but when you look at African Americans, we're not doing very well. And if you look at African American men in particular, really not well. Um, as populations change and we become less and less a country of non-Hispanic whites, we have, to, we have to change in part because the composition of the country is going that way, and we have to change in part because students want their institutions to look like the high schools they're attending. So we have to figure this out, and we have to um, be open to change. And I think uh, I heard um, Melvin Carter, mayor of St. Paul, talk to some higher ed leaders uh, this fall. And he said that he started as an undergraduate in business administration, and then in graduate school he moved to public policy. And he said, I was really struck by the way the definition of equity shifted as I made that disciplinary shift. He said, in the public policy sphere, equity is about warm, fuzzy feelings, do you feel welcome, et cetera. 
He said, in business administration, it's got nothing to do with feelings. It's about ownership and control. That's what equity is. And that coupled with some other experiences have led me to think about, you know, what's my aspiration for my classroom? Um, I think five years ago I would have said, I want all of my students to feel welcome in, in my classroom. And I think Mayor Carter is challenging me, saying, really? Because welcome can mean this is your space and you're allowing me to be in it. That is not an, an acceptable aspiration for my classroom. It has to be, I, I ultimately do own the classroom. I'm responsible. So in some sense, I own it. But from my students' perspective, they should all have an equal sense of ownership, that sense of equity of ownership and control. The warm, fuzzy feeling thing ultimately doesn't cut it. Um, at, at some point, the warm, fuzzy feeling yields when, when students realize, oh, oh, you, you're trying to make me feel warm, fuzzy feeling, but you're not really, you're not really willing to adapt who you are to make this space joint owned. Um, so I, I think the selective institutions have a lot that we can still be doing. And if we don't do it, we shouldn't expect what happened in 2013 to continue. So I, I think we need, we need to adapt with, with increasing the competitive forces. If if I can, um, on a food for thought um, and examination, uh, you know, places like Italy um, are having their own demographic uh, changes. In fact, all of Europe is having a pretty big demographic change uh, with a Mediterranean and Northern African um, uh, infiltration because it's not necessarily legalized. Um, I don't know whether you're, you're drawing any, um, it, whether you're comparing comparing those sorts of things, and I'd be just curious as, as to whether you are, and then you could throw in Australia and New Zealand as, as, as well, I suppose. The other thing I would, I would just say is you talked about halving immigration. We're f with climate change and other things happening, we're far more likely to have to double immigration, uh, and what does that, what does that do to, to your assumptions? Uh, and maybe it doesn't play into an 18-year uh, time frame. I, I understand that. Yeah, so um, let's see, in order. Yes, the rest of the world certainly has had a contraction. Uh, we were odd, frankly, in 2007, when we, as a developed country, had fertility rates above the replacement rate. Uh, we do see other uh, countries that are cutting back on numbers of institutions. J Japan is in the, you know, more than in the midst of this. They're well on their way in this process, for instance. Um, so I think it's a reminder of, hey, if, if you just want to see what happens if you stay on autopilot, it's, it's, it's going to be really uncomfortable. Um, maybe change about retention and your academic programs is a much more preferable path. Um, I think it's also a reminder when people ask me, so when do you think we'll get back to normal fertility rates? I say, well, what makes you think that 2007 was normal? I mean, I think it's optimistic and it speaks to maybe the optimism of the American people that it was a little bit unusual in 2007, but I don't, I don't see in other developed countries reason to think we'll go back there. I think we need to confront there are fewer babies being born and why don't we just go with the assumption that that'll continue for a while. And if it turns out that it reverses and we have increased retention and increased access and adapted our programs to be more aligned with, with work, great. I, st I still think that would be a good thing to do. Um, the second question, what was the second part? Oh, having immigration versus having doubling. Immigration, where, where you might argue that with climate change and other pressures, um, we, we're more like, I would argue that we're more likely to see a doubling of, of immigration, but. Yeah, so if we doubled immigration, that would help some, but only marginally. Part of the reason why it doesn't change the distribution of American uh, young people age 18 is because most people coming into the country until very recently weren't under age 18. And so if you look at the share of the population that are uh, non-native born, uh, at year five, I think it's something like 2%. By the time we get to age 18, it's 7%. So you could double that, and that would be helpful. But if you think about when they're coming, it's, it's probably a bit too late. So okay, that would increase the size of the age 18 population. It might ultimately help the non-traditional student-serving institutions. But probably those students, they are generally less likely. If you come into the country at age 16, you're not super likely to be attending college two years later. And so I think you know, we, can, we can hope for such things, but we shouldn't say, ah, there's the magic bullet to get us out of this. I don't have to adapt. So I'm not asking this because I think there's a magic bullet. <laughs> I'm wondering um, what is the impact of international student um, participation, given that we know during the last four years we had a significant decline, and certainly during COVID. So I'm just wondering how you see that playing yeah. out. 
So international student enrollments have grown faster than domestic student enrollments since World War II. Gives you hope, right? I mean, we had tremendous growth in domestic students. So the fact that international student growth was faster is impressive. That said, um, the, the decline is actually more than four years. Um, the first decline shows up in the 16-17 academic year. And I think that's important to know. So if you look at new international student enrollments, it's important to note because those who are enrolling in 16-17 made their decisions in early 2016. President Obama is still in the White House, and the next presidency is going to be a Clinton presidency. And yet there was a decline, which is to say that I think we saw during the Trump administration some unhelpful changes in terms of regulation, in terms of recruiting international students. And yet, that is not the only reason why we've seen contraction in international student enrollments. We see increased competition from the UK, Canada, Australia, and from India and China, who themselves are not that keen on sending a million students a year to the United States to study. They would like to retain those students. And so it's, it's a reminder that while the international market is enormous, and some institutions will find their way through a declining domestic market by, in part, expanding interna international students. We really ought not think, oh, it's just like a magic switch, you turn it on, like you said, it's not a magic bullet. We're gonna have to work really, really hard uh, to, to solve part of our problem that way, even if we entirely reverse the Trump administration um, effects, whether we think explicitly in, in, um, in regulation or implicitly in, in sort of some cultural capital. I think we face a, a highly competitive market there too, and increasingly so.